This video is part of a series of interviews with some of the parachute engineers, scientists, and developers who have been responsible for the most significant and advanced parachute systems of the last half century and was created by the Aviation Trail Parachute Museum in Dayton, Ohio. In June 2017, at the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics Forum, Charles Lowry, longtime deceleration researcher and member of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, interviewed Ed Vickery about his work and accomplishments in the parachute industry. I'm sitting here with Ed Vickery, my long-term uh, friend and professional uh, fellow that uh, I've known for so many years. He's played such an important part in the development of the parachute industry and getting us where we are. Uh, tell us, Ed, uh, where were you born and, uh, and where do you live now? Uh, I was born in a small town in Kentucky called Albany. And uh, there are lots of Albanys around the world, or around the U.S. at least. And I now live in Huntington Beach, California. What was your education and where did you go to school? I got my bachelor's in mechanical engineering from DIT, Detroit Institute of Technology. And then I was at a branch office out in Minnesota for Pioneer for a couple of years, and uh, I got about halfway through a master's in aeronautical engineering from the University of Minnesota before being transferred back. Was that in Minnesota? Was that yeah. when Doc Heinrich was there? Yes. Uh, Doc Heinrich was part of that branch office. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Dr. Heinrich was one of the pioneers in American, in yeah. German, and then American uh, parachutes, and he uh, went from the government service to uh, the University of Minnesota where he started a curriculum on parachutes. Mm -hmm. Did a lot of research too. Yeah. Where, where are the main places you've worked? Uh, the two main places, the two uh, largest parachute companies, Pioneer Parachute Company back then, Pioneer Aerospace now, and Irvin, uh, when I went there, it's now Airborne Systems. Those are the two major places. You at one time had your own business, did you not? I did for a while, yes. Uh, that was in hang gliders and ultralight aircraft, though. Okay. Well, tell us about the best or the most notable programs you worked on through your career, and what did you do? There are two uh, programs I work on that, that really are near and dear to my heart and, and that I really recall. Um, one was the uh, Mars Pathfinder program. Um, I was program manager on that and um, uh, very proud of the accomplishment that we made. And uh, Well, on the Mars, Mars Pathfinder program, uh, you were program manager. Did you then, you and your team, develop the recovery system for, that, for the landing, soft landing on Mars? Uh, yes, yes. Okay. And... Uh, the, the award for that that I mentioned, since I already mentioned it, I guess I'll just say it now. Back then, uh, um, NASA had this, um, they wanted to institute a better, faster, cheaper award. And I'm very proud of the fact that we got that award. We were the first one to get it. I don't know if anyone else got it since then. Uh, but we were, uh, had a, a, a good product and we were ahead of schedule. And under budget. Aside from the Mars program, how about your work in uh, gliding parachutes and uh, personal? Um, uh, tell us about that. Okay. Um, Ram air parachute, the whole thing. Yeah, and even before then, um, I got started into the parachute business through skydiving. And um, back when I was a freshman in college, someone asked me, if I'd heard of this new sport called skydiving, I hadn't. He said, these people jump out of airplanes. I said, you mean intentionally? He said, yes. And I, I made the comment, I'd never do that. Then he said something about, we kept talking, he said something about two parachutes. And I said, oh, they have a second one? And if the first one doesn't work? And he said, yes. So um, I said, well, maybe I will try that. I did, and back then we cut holes in parachutes and you know, we, we really didn't know very much of what we were doing. But from that, that led to uh, my job at, Parish, at at Pioneer because they were making these military surplus parachutes with pretty colors. 
And that was really great. And back then, you'd send out 200 resumes, or, or as many addresses as you could get, because that before computers or anything like that. Um, I sent one out with my fingers crossed, and they got in touch, and they hired me. So, so this was... Uh this work preceded the Ram Air parachute, is that yes, it? Yes, it did. So my, you, you were trying to make a conventional parachute glidable. Yes, we, we cut holes in conventional parachutes. Then my first job at Pioneer was uh, they had uh, just made contact with a Pierre Le Moyne from France. He brought over the parasail. You may have seen it in pictures of Acapulco and that. They wanted to be able to pack it, and compared to conventional parachutes, that was a nightmare at the time. And I put loops on the top and put crown lines on it, and things like that. And I converted that into what was called a Para Commander or PC, and that was the very first sport parachute designed from you know as a, as an original design, as opposed to cutting holes in existing parachutes. So you headed up that work, is that correct? I, I'm the person, I, I did that you work. You did that work. I did a lot of work. That did work. you jump the chute? Oh, yes, many times. Yes. Was that a development process where you would jump and change things? Yes, yes. And you did that exactly. for yes. a lot of years, huh? Yes. And then, uh, right after that, a Domino Jalbert. I came up with a Jalbert kite, and Pioneer had some arrangement with him. So they said, take a look at this, Ed, and, and I think the L over D was maybe at best one of the kite. And I developed that into a Ram Air canopy, and I got up to uh, about an L over D of around four. And a lot of the stuff that I see today uh, from a distance, a lot of that is work I did. Mm -hmm. But it's been refined a lot since then with a lot of... Mm -hmm pretty smart people who yeah. done a lot of good things, but I'm the first person to, and again, that was back when we, uh, I was a test jumper at Pioneer, and I developed that just through a lot of jump and, mm -hmm. you know, try it out and uh, make some changes and go do it again. Did you have to use your reserve a lot when you not very much, got into uh, not, changes? A couple of times, but, but yeah. no, not very often. Yeah. You know. Sometimes there are planned cutaways, like we jump real small pair of shoots in the beginning, and we knew we were going to cut away. So in that case, well, I didn't go to reserve. I went to a second parachute. Still had a reserve after that. So mm -hmm. I was wearing the test unit plus two. I always did that when I was doing uh, testing. I would have a the test unit itself, and then two more parachutes, two a, main, more, a yeah. main and a reserve. Yeah. Yep. Well, during your career, um, and, and I know it extended way beyond the, what you just described, what, what people did you most enjoy working with and, and who did you most admire in the I, business? Yeah, I, I would say uh, in terms of enjoy and admire, I, I would say one and the same. Um, John Kiker of NASA comes to mind and a lot of other people at NASA. Um, I would say Jim Reuter at Pioneer and several others there, and I don't want to try to mention others, I might forget somebody, but uh, him and others. And at Airborne, I would say uh, Phil Delergio and Rob Sinclair, and there are a lot of others there as well. And outside of that, Chuck, I would say you. No. I, uh, I admire you greatly, and I, uh, I hope I'm embarrassing you. You are. <laughs> but, uh, that definitely goes on that list. It's mutual. Well, how was it, how did you do your job when you first got in the business and versus how things are done now? I'm talking about how things are done in the industry then versus now. Yeah, that's a good question because at my age, when I started, <clears throat> we had a slide rule. There were no calculators. Uh, a few years into it, they were uh, mechanical you know, the Frieden calculator where you pull a handle, but there were no uh, calculators, computers, internet, any of that thing. So we did a lot in the way of hands-on uh, trial and test and using our intuition. And I gotta say, I think the intuition is better when you have to use it a lot as opposed to when you have all these other tools that we have now. 
Uh, I think you lose a little bit of that, but nevertheless, uh, the tools that are available now, as to the second part to your question, you know, with the computers and all the analytical method things that Ben Tut and his group does, uh, there's so many things that you can do through analysis now that get you closer to where you want to be. You still have to go out and test, but the analytical tools that are available today, today really get you a lot closer to where you want to be, and there's less of that hands-on and testing you have to do to get to the final place where you want to be, the final product. During your career, what innovations did you uh, participate in, and what uh, innovations did you especially appreciate as you saw these things coming through your career? Um, well, I already mentioned the pair commander and the uh, ram air canopy. I think those were mm -hmm. um, really well. The other thing that I would mention that just now popped into my mind, uh, we had to figure out how, what's the L over D of the canopy, what's the sink rate, uh, and being able to do that without, real expensive, without going to Yuma or back then it was uh, El Central to a test range to get data. So I developed this little glide angle indicator that I had on the end of a, um, I think it was a car antenna, but after my parachute was open, I'd slide that, I could read the glide angle. I had a sensitive altimeter, I could read the altitude, and I would say, coming up on 3,000 feet, mark. And uh, there'd be a, a time to go with that, that you could time the tape later. So we did a lot of work like that in terms of glide angle and things like that. And I am kind of proud of one thing. That glide angle indicator worked if you were in an updraft, it saw relative wind. Mm -hmm. You'd still have an elbow of DF4, even if you're going up. If you were down at El Centro with our Cine Theodolite, you're going up, it'd it say you had uh, an L over D of infinity plus something because you're going up. Mm -hmm. So I was pretty proud of that. that. Is that used today? No, I, not to my knowledge. Yeah. I don't think there's much work, test jumping going on today. Work for you? Yeah. <laughs> well, what, uh, what parachute? Uh, breakthroughs, innovation type that would you like to see or expect now? Um, I would like to see some work done with uh, low density parachutes, uh, things like for landing on Mars or other areas with low density. I do understand if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And the uh, uh, disc gap band has worked well. But I don't think, or I suspect at least, <clears throat> you would not be able to keep on uh, making it larger and larger for larger payloads. Mm -hmm. I don't, and um, I think you'd run into problem with a single parachute with a, the exact plan form that's been used before. You know, the ratio of the disc to the gap and the, the ratio of the gap to the band and things like that. You can devi deviate some, as we did on uh, Mars Pathfinder, but um, I don't think you can scale it up directly. And continue to do that for larger and larger payrolls. So if you get into clusters, now it's no longer heritage. So I would like to see some work done, and some has been started, but I would like to see that continue. In the direction of usable clusters? Well, in the direction of parachutes designed for low density, for Mars. Single right? shoots. Single shoots and clusters, but single, mm -hmm. single shoots to start with. Mm -hmm. Something to replace the disc gap band or improve on it. It's okay now, but someday I suspect it won't. Tell me what lessons has your work life taught you, your work life? I think that <clears throat> you get out what you put in. Um, if you give it your best shot, I think you will if not necessarily at that point, at some point in your life, you will receive it. I think you get back more than you give. I think that's true of, of the work life. How about your immediate family? Tell, tell us about you. Well, I've got an interesting, very short story about my son, Michael. Um, <clears throat> he flunked out of college, and now he's a doctor. <laughs> so <laughs> there's a lot of stuff in between, but I... Uh, have told many people, the only person I ever met 
who was more immature than my son, was his father at that <laughs> age. <clears throat> but and, is that your only child? <clears throat> no, that's my son. I have a daughter named Diane. She lives in Florida. She's head of a, um, HR in a large company out there. She has two sons, meaning I have two grandsons, Braden and Tyler, and they're so much fun, and I just enjoy being with them. And her husband's name is Brad, Brad Williams. And Brad is an excellent father, great husband. Diane is an excellent, you know, mother and great, great wife. So they have a really good family, and I really enjoy going out to visit. Well, I visit them five or six times per year. Oh, that's great. Well, um, think about this one. What uh, big non-work lessons, non-work lessons has life taught you? I think that's pretty close. I think you get out of life what you put into it. And um, it's, um, well, let me say this. Uh, you know me. You know I'm a religious person, late in life anyway. And you can't outgive God. Mm -hmm. And I think that's true. Um, it's one case where God says, test me this one thing. It has to do with money. <clears throat> I think it's true of volunteer work. So um, here again, I think you, the more you give, the more you get back. Mm -hmm. And I have seen that over and over and over again throughout my life. That's a great lesson. <clears throat> I think so. Tell me one uh, more thing. Uh, what advice would you give to young engineers that are walking into the industry today? Well, that's pretty easy because that goes back to what I just yeah. said. <laughs> give it your best shot. Mm -hmm. Because if you do, uh, you'll get back more than you put in. may not be immediate, but in my opinion, you will somewhere down the line. Way more than you put in. So don't slack off. Just give it your best shot. Be yourself and give it your best. Is there anything else you'd like to add? We've asked certain questions. Well, I think you've covered a lot, Chuck, okay. and I appreciate being uh, you know, involved in this, and I want to thank you. The Aviation Trail Parachute Museum in Dayton, Ohio, tells the story of the development of the freefall parachute from its invention at Dayton's McCook Field after World War I through the vital role the parachute plays today in the decelerator industry and safely landing spacecraft. The museum includes interactive exhibits, artifacts, historic photographs, and films. Aviation Trail Incorporated has developed a self-guided tour of select aviation-related sites that are open to the public in the Dayton area. Aviation Trail's mission is to preserve and promote the Dayton area's unique aviation heritage, beginning with the invention of the airplane by Wilbur and Orville Wright. Find out more at aviationtrailinc.org.